It is the way this week. It is World Cities Day today and we'll tell you how two of Somalia's largest cities are making steps to be counted in the world stage. Also this hour, still the spotlight still in the latest political developments in Kenya with the announcement by the opposition leader Nasser of sustained protests. Our regular pundits here at KTN News, Joy Brendan Devo, who is a lawyer and political analyst, Mark Bichachi, who is a political an analyst, as well as Javas Bigambo governance expert, will help us contextualize the next steps for Kenya after the devising October 26th poll. But first, here's a quick look at Africa in 60 seconds. Kenya's opposition leader, Raila Odinga, has vowed to sustain protest and economic sabotage against the Jubilee government. Liberia's president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, differs with her deputy over claims that she is interfering with the presidential election. Four people quarantined in Kitale after suspicion that they contracted the Marburg virus from a visiting Ugandan national. A rebirth in two of Somalia's largest cities that are emerging out of decades of ruin due to sustained clan wars and insurgency. Many thanks for joining us tonight. Let's begin by taking a look at our Twitter poll tonight. And we are asking you, should the international community intervene in the Kenyan political standoff? Should the international community intervene in the Kenyan political standoff? You can tweet me your thoughts at Sharon underscore Momani or at KTN Kenya at KTN News. I shall be sampling your views at the tail end of this bulletin. And we want to begin the developments following that assault on journalists covering a NASA event at the Wiper headquarters this afternoon. And the Kenya Editors Guild has condemned the assault on journalists who are waiting to cover the big announcement by NASA leader Raila Odinga. Through the chairman Linus Kaikai, the Editors Guild said it was troubling that such an attack could take place within the presence of a party headquarters. NASA has apologized after youth beat up citizen to his senior political reporter. Francis Gashuri and NTV camera person Jen Gatwiri. NASA said they, that they had acted on their own and vowed to take action against the suspects. The editors want NASA to hand over the suspected hooligans who infiltrated the meeting to police. This is not the first time that such an attack has happened on journalists during Kenya's heated campaign season. KTN News journalists Trix Ingado and George Maringa were accosted by a rowdy mob in Kawangware, while Rashid Ronald was wrapped up by anti-riot police officers in Kisumu while covering anti-IBC demonstrations. <laughs> And the leader of the Kenyan opposition coalition, NASA, Raila Odinga, has vowed to continue protesting against the electoral body, IBC, for conducting what he said was yet another fraudulent election on October 26th. Odinga boycotted the rerun of the presidential election last week, as said that NASA will form a task force to review systemic electoral failure and performance of police, as well as structure of the executive, announcing the coalition's next steps after Uhuru Kenyatta was declared declared winner of the repeat poll, Raila said that no reforms had been made to the IBC after the Supreme Court found irregularities and illegalities in the original poll. Turnout for the vote was just under 39%. According to Raila, elections in Kenya risk becoming coronation rituals. It's important a president who is in office unconstitutionally. You have a constitution with ambiguous provisions on the standards that elections must fulfill. The same constitution states that power can only be exercised by democratically elected leaders. If sham elections are allowed to stand, what will stop the regime from conducting sham referenda to remove the constitutional provisions that they do not like? like, for example, term limits, 
nothing. NASA has two organs, the Coalition's Parliamentary Party, PP, and the National Resistance Movement. The resistance movement shall be responsible for implementing a vigorous, positive political action program that includes economic boycotts, peaceful processions, picketing, and other legitimate forms of protest. Peaceful protest is an inalienable political right. As an inalienable political right, it's one of the most important freedoms that we have secured for ourselves in our 2010 constitution. Every person has a right peaceably and unwarned to assemble, to demonstrate, to picket, and to present petitions to public authorities. That is Article 37. And Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf on Monday hit back at claims uh, that by her own vice president that she had interfered in the election to choose her successor by meeting polling officials at her residence. Vice President Joseph Boakai came runner up to former international footballer George Ware in the October 10th presidential election, triggering a runoff round uh, as neither man won a majority of the votes. The ruling Unity Party, backing Boakai, said on Sunday, it would join two other parties in lodging complaints with the National Elections Commission, uh, NEC, over what it termed as Salif's quote-unquote interference with the electoral process, along with other issues of quote-unquote massive systematic irregularities and fraud. The presidential election runoff is scheduled for November 7th. The office of the president wishes to state unequivocally that these allegations as contained in the special statement delivered by the three parties are completely baseless and are an unfortunate attempt by agent provocateurs to honor Liberia's democratic process. And in the troubled Democratic Republic of Congo, four civilians and a policeman were killed Monday in clashes in eastern city of Goma as protesters demanded President Joseph Kabila to stand down this year. The journalist said he saw the bodies of four civilians lying in blood in the Majengo district of Goma, capital of the troubled North Kivu province, while the body of a policeman who had been hit with stones was on the ground in the neighboring district of Mabanga. Tensions are running high in the DRC after Kabila failed to step down on the expiry of his second and final term last December. Elections were due to take place this year under a transitional deal aimed at avoiding bloodshed in a country beset by ethnic divisions and fighting in its east. The country's electoral commission says there will, uh, there will be no vote before early uh, 2019. <laughs> Since this morning, we have been hearing gunshots, but God has helped me, and I have come to relieve those who spent the night at the medical center. And when I got to the hospital, they started bringing in gunshot wounds. <laughs> They say they received a message saying that there were Mai Mai among demonstrators. And that's how they started shooting live ammunition at point blank range in the population. We wonder which Mai Mai would come to demonstrate in Majengo district. 
let's stay in the Democratic Republic of Congo and some 3.2 million people in the Democratic Republic of Congo's conflict ravaged South Central uh, Greater Kasai region are severely food insecure, struggling to feed themselves and in urgent need of assistance. The head of the United Nations Food Relief Agency has warned WFP Executive Director David Bisley who was visiting the country this week uh, said that President Joseph Kabila has agreed to help aid reach a region of the Democratic Republic of Congo where ethnic conflict has spawned a humanitarian emergency. The conflict in Kasai region turned Congo into the world's biggest displacement crisis this year. Uh, based on our scaling up intentions over the next few months, our eight month, our six month, uh, eight month, over the next eight months, we need $135 million just for the Kasai region alone. Over the next six months for the DRC, in addition to that, we need $139 million over the next six months. We only have 1% of the funding from the donors for the money that we need. 3.2 million people are at severe risk as we speak. Hundreds of thousands of children are on the brink of starvation. So we need to ramp up. We're there. We're ready to go. We need the donors to step in now. If they don't, not only are people going to die and children are going to die, you're going to have long-term chaos that's going to cost a lot more. And a Dutch-Ethiopian national Monday denied committing war crimes during bloody purges in Ethiopia in the late 1970s, known as the Red Terror, denying that he ever signed orders to execute political opponents. The suspect, Sheti Alemu, told a Dutch court that prosecutors, quote-unquote, had the wrong person. As his trial opened in The Hague, Alemu is alleged to have been a henchman for former Marxist dictator Mengistu Haile Mariam in northwestern Goijam village, province rather. Uh, the hearings involve, quote unquote, a grim series of events involving the incarceration, torture, and murder of opponents of the 1970s revolutionary regime in Ethiopia. A total of 321 victims have been named in four war crimes charges, which include the arbitrary detention and cruel and inhuman treatment of civilians and fighters. Toelaat. Ik en stel dan nog enkele andere kwesties aan de orde die vandaag eerst bespreking behoeven. That justice will be done, and I hope the world will bring Colonel Mangistu. Right now in the Netherlands for uh, for the last 39 years, but. Uh, I was born and raised in Addis, and I've seen this red terror action by the Dirk regime. What I really want is actually that his leader, Colonel Mangistu, should be brought to justice as well. I've been a member of the Dirk regime in Ethiopia about 40 years ago. It's, uh, it's now about 40 years ago. But I didn't commit the crimes they said I, have, I, sh I should have committed. Like the prosecutor says, I haven't tortured people, I haven't uh, killed people, and I didn't know about that. So that's, that's his official opinion in this case. And health officials in Transzoia County have issued an alert of a suspected Ebola-like Marburg virus. Four people quarantined in Boai of a suspected Marburg infection and blood samples sent to Camry for tests. It is suspected that disease made its way into Transzoia from an already infected Ugandan citizen who visited a herbalist at Boai village of Kaisagat location in Kwanzaa constituency to seek medication. Health officials who confirmed the incident said samples have been taken to Camry for further testing. Transoya County Public Health Officer Nobat Musundi said that they are already following crucial leads through various stakeholders to minimize any transmission from human to human. Yeah? What we are doing now is we are uh, line listing the conduct. You see, the, the everybody who has come in contact with that, that suspected case, because so far we have not confirmed. We've taken samples to Cambridge in Nairobi. We have not recorded uh, any single outbreak of Ebola previously. And in previous uh, years, 
we had to record some three cases of suspected uh, Mabak viruses around Mount Elgon region. That has happened previously. So we have reports that uh, there has been a Mabak outbreak. Uh, in fact, not, not necessarily uh, as, uh, to the scale of the West African region, but about six cases reported in the, the region in Uganda. It's a region called Queen. And let's now take you to Ivory Coast, where victims of the disfiguring Norma disease have newfound hope. For 17 of her 20 years, Flora Dome has hidden from the world. Now she nervously waits for the operation to repair her ravaged face, restoring her hope for a life. For most of her life, Flora has been forced to shut herself away at home to escape insults and mocking glances. She developed a bacterial disease called Noma when she was three years old, which caused the growth to cover most of her face. It is because of this illness that my parents didn't want me to go to school. Because by going to school, people will laugh at me. Nine out of ten patients with Noma die from the disease and survivors are disfigured for life. To remedy this problem, this volunteer medical team offers free surgical care to treat patients' faces. In just one week, the team has operated on about 50 patients. The problem is that it reaches all levels. It reaches the skin, it reaches the muscles, it reaches the bone and it reaches the mucous membrane, the skin inside the mouth and nose. So we try to replace these tissues by bringing tissues from another part of the body. Some patients have to undergo several procedures, but all medical expenses are covered by the Ivorian NGO Smile One Day, which oversees the program. Through facial reconstruction, the association hopes to help Noma sufferers overcome exclusion. And as World Cities Day is observed today, two of Somalia's largest cities are experiencing an impressive renaissance more than 25 years after law and order collapsed across the country. Mayor Thabit Abdi Mohammed of Mogadishu and his Kismayo counterpart Ibrahim Mohammed Yusuf describe the rise of the two cities from the ashes of civil war and the hard work that has gone into modernizing them. The Mogadishu mayor acknowledges that the capital can currently offer only basic public services to its residents, but he has plans to increase his administration's revenue and budget through innovative methods. Kismayo was liberated from the control of Al-Shabaab in 2012, but it is located in a region that harbors one of the largest number of Islamist militants. <laughs> Since Mogadishu was a city without an administration where basic services, especially utilities, were under the private sector and still remain so, we appreciate what they have done. In the meantime, we need to collaborate on how to improve charges for services, hygiene, or controlling prices for services rendered to residents. Now we have a policy. Since the world is moving fast towards public and private sectors working together, at the moment, services are under the private sector. <laughs> Government institutions have increased, roads have been built, Governance has improved, and different ministries working on their own buildings came up. The day we came here, there was nothing. We created this system and the offices we are working in. So the government has done something tangible. The private sector has constructed multiple story buildings. The government has built guest houses at the beach where visitors and leaders are welcome. The presidential palace was built from scratch and the former insurance building, parliament building, conference hall, Dawad, were also rebuilt during this administration. 
All right, we want to go for a break now, but when we come back, our regular pundits here at KTN News, Joy Brandam Devo, Javas Bigambo, and Mark Bichachi will be having a conversation with me, just really looking at the way forward after that divisive, very divisive, repeat presidential poll, and after that announcement that was made by the opposition leader, Raila Odinga, on the way forward. So you want to stick around for that. And even as we go for the short commercial break right now, let's also look at events taking place across Africa.